I feel happy when I'm in nature. Yeah, I like flowers and trees and leaves. I think we should look after nature because it gives us so much stuff. Nature is important. It's Grandpa is really beautiful trees. Yes, they are. One of the common myths that is on the street about conservation authorities is that they all got started after Hurricane Hazel. Can you tell us a little bit more about how they actually did get started well in advance of Hurricane Hazel? Conservation Authorities Act was passed in 1946 and uh, that was a post-war initiative of the government of Leslie Frost. But the first two conservation authorities uh, was the Asabo Valley Conservation Authority and the Etobicoke Authority, both created in 1946. Between 1952 and 1956, when the authority en ended, the Humber Valley Authority, they had expanded their programs and we acquired Albion Hills. Uh, and uh, it was the first conservation area in the province of Ontario. But the reason for the Asabo uh, Valley Conservation Authority and the Etobicoke Authority starting early is both of them had major flood problems. But both of those authorities ultimately developed comprehensive conservation programs for the whole watershed, not just flood control. The watershed that was impacted the most was, uh, was the Humber, where the majority of the damage and most of the loss of life uh, was, uh, and it was pretty well throughout the whole watershed. I can still remember being down by the Humber River at Old Mill and looking up in a tree and thinking, why is that car up in a tree? And that was when I realized how high the water had been and the velocity of it. In all honesty, it broke Dad's heart, really, to see that all of those lives had to be lost. I think you're right. I think the, uh, we've either, again, by design, or just been very fortunate in terms of the leadership. I, I think having the right person in the right place at the right time has allowed us to grow the way, the way we have. And I think it's been very fortunate to have you know, the forester and, and a get it done kind of guy like Ken um, involved right from the very beginning, you know, which kind of set the foundation for the, uh, for the authority. And then we've kind of grown and you're now taking it to a whole new level as we Richardson move into the future. Forester. Sometimes there are too many foresters. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> The title that my father had, and then this title was retired when he retired, was Chief Conservation Engineer with the Department of Planning and Development Conservation Branch. They would hire a group of university students to study the land, the water, the vegetation, and so on. The information would all come back, and then over the period of the next year, two years probably, they would then write a conservation report, which then Dad would present to his minister to present into the Ontario Parliament. He knew how to handle politicians. I think he probably ran into a lot of opposition as various things were presented, but he didn't give up. This was the whole thing. He kept going back at it, and he would go back at it. Richardson's skill, his real skill, was nurturing the local people to take the initiative to do work in their watershed. Richardson really is the father of the Conservation Authorities of Ontario, no question about it. The tasks that we face in environmental stewardship are just much beyond uh, the ability of any one person or when any one organization. And so working in partnership is, is just absolutely essential. Let's, let's start with the fact that a ravine or a river uh, or a valley, they, they don't really understand the concept of uh, municipal boundaries. I mean, they're not aware of where the boundary is between sort of Toronto and York Region or Toronto and Peel. It's not on their radar screen. And so, uh, you know, I think that the notion we would have a table, a place, where everybody who's affected by and who affects through their activities and decisions these precious natural assets would sit together 
and actually plan together and actually pay together, um, you know, is, is vital. I mean, I, I'm actually astounded when you see how well it works as a model. The idea of working across municipal boundaries is really, really critical. Municipal politicians tend to focus on what they can control and what impacts them. And by going on a watershed boundary, you get outside of those lines and actually realize that what your neighbor's doing impacts you profoundly. Right. What you're doing impacts your neighbors. And if you work collectively uh, for the broader good and a bigger perspective, it is so much more effective in terms of accomplishing what a conservation authority set out to do. Despite the differences in sizes of conservation authorities with, with some as small as you know five to six staff and some as large yeah. as TRCA with well over 400 staff, we're yeah. still one family. I've always enjoyed the relationship with the TRCA because they've always been there. You know, 30, for almost 40 years ago when I started to practice, the, the Conservation Authority was right there at issues. I've always thought of them as, you know, there's a water department and a sewer department and a transit department, and TRC is in the green infrastructure business. And there's millions of people who live here, and, and they need that. They need the green infrastructure. Evergreen's been working with the TRCA for 25 years. It's been the full life of the organization. and. The working relationship has involved planting events across the ravine system of Toronto and also the magic of this particular site, uh, an asset that technically is owned by the TRCA uh, and a partnership we formed with them about almost 15 years ago now to try to make sense out of this old industrial complex. The way I know Brian and my relationship with the TRCA really sprung from a collaborative effort to create Trees for Life. So I'm the volunteer chair of Trees for Life and the uh, Highway of Heroes Living Tribute. My connection with the TRC is a bizarre one, just because uh, I'm, I'm from the arts and culture world. We were doing great big projects at Harbourfront outside. A lot of these artists were interested in the environment, but interested in, in it in a different way. So I contacted Brian Denny at TRCA and said, we'd really like to do a project with the TRCA. The uh, Waterfront Toronto has been involved with the TRCA ever since its inception back, oh, 13 years ago. I think when you look at building great cities and complete communities, looking after the natural environment's a, a normal part of that and an important part of it. So we've been involved in projects right from day one with the TRCA as our partner. So we do urban designs, we do urban revitalization, and part of that is how do you look after the natural environment, and we bring in a partner who has the expertise to do that, and, and TRCA have been that great partner. The partnerships that we've had over the years, I have several really good examples of working together to find solutions on development problems or uh, low impact development is one example of us moving forward and, and finding ways to improve the environment. Yeah, there's, there's been a lot, uh, a lot of positive work. We've had our challenges, of course, but as long as we work in that framework of trying to find the solution and community build, we're, uh, we're happy to work with the RCA. The relationship between the Region and Municipality of York and the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority is a long-standing one. We share like goals for creating healthy, safe, and caring communities. Do I agree with everything TRCA says? No. Do they agree with everything I say? No. But do we work well together? Yeah, I think we do. And I think our staffs in your department and our departments work well together. So I've been very aware of TRCA for many years uh, when I was Director of Architecture and Urban Design uh, in the city uh, back in the era of David Crombie, John Sewell and Art Eagleton. Of course we worked with TRCA. More recently the competition for the Lower Don, the Don River coming into Toronto Harbour had major involvement with the TRCA over flood proofing, naturalization, and so on. Right from the beginning, Parks Canada and the TRCA clicked. And I think we saw in each other that similarity in uh, mandate, in mission, the types of employees that we have, and the type of work that we do. And I think above anything else, uh, TRCA and Parks Canada share a passion for the environment in which we work. We share a passion for the communities in which we're working, and we have extremely wonderful, dedicated employees. We do have very dedicated staff, and I'm finding that more and more each year. They're young, they're active, they're committed, 
they're out there with their boots on, so to speak. And I think that's one of the reasons that we do get things done. I think staff at TRCA too, um, they probably put in another half a week uh, dedicating their time to work outside of their workplace. Right. If you believe as I do that the sort of physical structures of, of the city and the magnificent physical structures, we're so lucky, I don't think we even realize how lucky we are to have these ravines and to have the green space we have, the watersheds we have. If, if those are the soul, and if those are like the arteries and the veins and so on of the city, including the heart, everything uh, like that needs a brain. And the brain is the conservation authority. The brain is where people sit and make decisions, they use data, they use science to sort of actually make decisions about how to protect all of this, how to, you know, where the line is drawn in terms of how much you can use it uh, without hurting it and, and give people fair access to it. So it's the brain um, of, of, the, of the natural environment of this region. And I think if people think of it that way, they will realize how important the conservation authority is. This has to be done somewhere. Think of the consequences if we weren't doing it anywhere. The TRCA is a sort of behind the scenes, honest broker partner in, in so many relationships. In some cases, it offers physically the terrain in which to do the work, but very, very often it's also the underlying helping partner in, in providing leveraging funding or science expertise. Uh, sometimes the TRCA is the lead, but we probably all underestimate how often TRCA is, is one of the, you know, the midwives of making new projects happen. You have a consistent overlay that goes over all of it, right? Which is yep. headwaters to lake, the jurisdiction of the rivers. It, it, it cross-pollinates thinking. The authority is semi-autonomous. I think it's a great bridge between municipal governments, provincial governments, and the people. The TRCA has done marvelous work over the years. Uh, it's gotten better as it went along. I mean, it began to be trusted more by, by agencies and governments. More than that, you actually uh, engage with all of the parties so that they understand why it is you're trying to do what you're trying to do. And if there are other ways of doing it uh, that are creative and interesting, then you seem to be able to, to bring those on board. The Conservation Authority is an example of something that works. You have all these governments, I mean, they don't sit together hardly anywhere else and actually work well together and you don't hear complaints about the budget. I mean, it is what it is and it's doing something that people understand to be very important. And it works and so it's a, it, instead of being something that's fairly obscure, it should be a model we should be trumpeting and saying let's do this other places where we have trouble sometimes sitting together and making decisions that are for the benefit of the whole region. The, the working partnership between Evergreen and the TRCA for the last 25 years has been in, in trying to find creative ways to bring nature into the city and in kind of exploring the culture of nature inside what is typically a very urban, hard, concrete landscape of, of downtown Toronto. And that experiment has been incredibly rewarding. It's been an amazing series of successes, you know, periodically failures, but the fact that the TRCA has had the courage to test ideas, to be creative and be bold with ideas has meant that our partnership's been fantastic. The need to open people's eyes to what we have and as their eyes are open, the value mm -hmm. I think that society has relative to these spaces is just going to go up. The more we experience it, the more we value it. The more we value it, the more willing we are to protect it. So I think I mean, it really fits in well with the overall revitalization of Toronto's waterfront. And we call it revitalization of purpose because it's not about real estate. It's about building quality of life. It's about a, a building an environment that allows us to attract the talent for the next century, that keeps us competitive as a city and a country and a province. So all that fits together to make a higher quality of life. And the TRCA's component of that, it's an addition to that, has been very valuable. I think TRCA has, has also been a leader in terms of, of identifying best management practices, yeah. working with the development sector, similarly working with the agricultural sector. The other thing I think that TRCA has excelled at is working with the multicultural community and, and, and tuning their programs to, to working with the variety of cultures that we have in the City of Toronto. And a, again, we talk about how TRCA is, is, is a leader in that and I think that they're yeah. starting to be able to demonstrate to some of our, our other
conservation authorities um, is that if we want to continue to educate people about the work that we're doing, we've got to look at all different cultures. Yeah. The notion which uh, you have to, I think, always be wary of is that nature is a place apart that you visit. Uh, is a very dangerous notion for a city. In fact, a city should be a marriage with nature. That, that, that this, the urban area, the natural areas, the natural environment, the urban environment, the human environment, all of these things should come together in a, in a very sweet way. You have to begin with the natural forces that are present in the place. And, and then see what you need to do with it in relation, A, uh, to people being able to make a living and at the same time build communities in relation to it. But you begin, if you come with ecology later, you lose. There's no, we did that, we know what that means, right? Getting it back is far more expensive, far more contentious. So you've got to begin with the ecological basis of the human environment you're in. A livable city is a, a challenging thing to define and everybody has their own definitions for it, but for mine it obviously incorporates uh, a strong dose of nature as a primary ingredient uh, in, in the design and ongoing kind of function of a city. But it also includes a lot of room for citizen participation in the evolution of the city. We're an urban culture in Canada and we're an urban culture emerging globally. So the role of organizations like the TRCA and Evergreen for that matter is, is central to uh, the idea of sustainable cities and livable cities in the future. This is what's really required to make this city livable, this kind of uh, network of partnerships and networks of volunteers and people who work, usually tirelessly and without any credit, for the betterment of the city. And one of the issues is, and that's why we were interested in doing these exhibitions, the public think this just all happens, or they think the government does it. Well, the government's involved, but I mean, they don't understand the organizations, like TRC and other organizations, who are actually working to protect these places for us. One of the things that I remark about the TRCA is what a forward-looking organization it is to not only be dealing with the day-to-day -day challenges of protecting the watershed, but to put into place that expertise, those systems, those policies and programs that will allow us to be able to protect this watershed, these watersheds, well into the future. We will continue to have this long-standing relationship where we work together and with others. There are many, many things that we can work together on. I see the TRCA playing a big role in being the steward, the custodian actually, of a regional network of connected green spaces. We need to make sure that we can manage what we have properly and have a vision of what our children and grandchildren want for the future. I can't imagine a better time for the Conservation Authority. The Conservation Authority is perfect for the 21st century. It's an incredibly important organization, so you support it. Uh, that doesn't mean it's perfect all the time or that it makes every decision right, but you support it in terms of the principle of what it does, the partnership it represents, and the important things that it does in a very practical sense. And so you'll certainly be able to count on uh, continued leadership as long as I'm here that does just that because it's too important uh, not to uh, have a, a body that you support uh, in carrying out those assignments. A, a soul lasts forever and as a result the mandate of the TRCA to preserve the physical soul of this region uh, is an indefinite assignment. So 60 years is just the beginning. It's wonderful to be able to congratulate TRCA on its history and it has been around for a long time. I think the really important thing is that it has discovered ways to uh, benefit from those changes, an understanding of the full dimension of sustainability, an understanding that we have to pay attention to the world around us, and an understanding of the whole array of tools that we have to do the job better. What I would like to see is the authority continue its good work and expand it to be able to come to accommodate that tremendous growth that's going to take place. We have a choice as to what kind of an ecosystem we want. You can have 
crows and squirrels, or you can have interior <laughs> bird species and deer and all kinds of wildlife that, that make the city uh, a living city more than just a big urban concrete blob. Living city, that's a that's a good line, Craig. That is a good line. We yeah. should use that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't take credit for it, unfortunately. Well, you, you, you should take credit for it. You had a lot to do with the process that got us to that. As we wrap up, I, I am really excited about the future prospects mm -hmm. for the Conservation Authority. And it's always going to have to be based on a responsible approach to the management of our natural resources and careful uh, attention to natural hazards but at the same time developing a, a healthy ecosystem that adds so much to the quality of life in this region. So as I get ready to pass the, uh, the torch to the next generation of leadership at, at TRC, I think we're really well positioned. It's in large part based on what you guys already did to get us there. So uh, I think the organization has a very exciting future. I'm very happy to be able to say happy birthday Congratulations, felicitations to the Conservation Authority because it has survived um, 60 years is a long time for any organization. But I think what's important to me is that it's learned the lessons that allow it to evolve and to become better than it probably ever was. And so in saying happy birthday, I would also say uh, keep up the good work, uh, encourage you to, uh, to continue to learn, to continue to grow, to have the, both the patience and the, um, and the commitment because that's what this world is going to continue to need. What should we think we could do? Do you think we can protect nature? I'm very happy, Grandpa.